Welcome to our review of Seas of Havoc, specifically the Sea Monster Edition from Rock Manor Games, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this pirate-themed naval battle. Seas of Havoc comes from the duo of Sebastian Bernier Wong and Peter Gorniak, and it features artwork from Nebetsi Zitro. It was published just this year by Rock Manor Games after a very successful Kickstarter. Now, there were three games, three versions of the game that were published. Uh, there's a retail version, the Sea Monster Edition, and the Captain's Deluxe Edition. It's the Sea Monster Edition that we were sent, and that's what we'll be highlighting in this review. While there were a few copies of Seas of Havoc that showed up at local game stores and a few online shops, it looks like the only place to get the one now is direct from Rock Manor. Even there, they are sold out of the retail version, but as of right now, you can get the Sea Monster Edition on sale for under $100 Canadian. So Seas of Havoc is an abstract naval battle game that plays anywhere from one to five players, either individually, in teams, with rules for up to three AI opponents. Game length is very player and player count dependent, but it doesn't tend to go over an hour and a half once everyone's at least learned the game and played at least once. The suggested age here is 13 plus, which seems to be more component based than anything else. We can both see younger players enjoying this one, though the game does have some weight to it and there's quite a bit going on. So pick a captain and a ship and head out into the seas of havoc, a mystical sea with unusual properties. Start each round by sending skiffs to the various islands to collect resources, upgrade your ship and improve your deck. Then move on to the sea phase and battle the other captains through programmed movement style card play. The winner will be the pirate with most infamy at the end of the game. For a look at the components in this pirate-themed naval battle game, check out our Seas of Havoc unboxing video on YouTube. Now remember, we have the Sea Monster Edition, which has everything in the Retail Edition, but also two new captains and three sets of sea monsters that can be added to your game. Now in the video, you'll see that the component quality here is really good. I love the small plastic cannonballs and the fact they're not actually round, so they don't roll away, though do note they do bounce. Uh, the card quality is good. The rule book is very clear. Iconography on the cards and boards is excellent. Um, the only complaint I have is that whoever designed the box insert obviously never had a full set of components in front of them because they didn't account for the fact there's a plastic grommet that holds the player boards together. And because of that, they don't actually fit into the insert. They also did the thing where they give you an insert that's clearly designed to hold specific things in specific places, but don't actually tell you what goes where. Yeah, sadly, they might have been better off giving you an empty box with baggies. But with that, let us move on to an overview of play. Note, this isn't in any way meant to be a rules teach. This is just to give you an idea of the game, whether it may be for your group or not. There's going to be a lot going on here in Seas of Havoc. It's a mashup of worker placement, deck building, program movement, and naval battle. So the game starts with each player choosing a captain and a ship. There were six of each of these to choose from in the core game, leaving lots of possible combinations. Note, despite the fact there are six ships and six captains, the player count does stop at five. Each captain gives the player an asymmetric in-game bonus, and each ship has its own unique starting set of cards, as well as two unique upgrade cards. So once this choice is made, the players will take the player board and pieces in the appropriate color based on the ship. They then slot their captain into their board and make up their starting deck by adding the two captain specific cards to the uh, ship specific cards. The two ship upgrade cards are placed face down next to your board. Everyone takes one of each of the resources of sail, coin and cannonball. The board is then set up, which involves rolling coordinate dice and placing rocks, gusts and whirlpools, as well as two sunken treasure tokens. Our deck is shuffled and an initial market of five cards is placed next to the board. Start player is determined and players place their ships using the dice and then deciding which way they want to face. At this point, some players will get bonus resources based on the player order. Then you're ready to start. Now, each round of Sea of Havoc starts with the island phase. Here, players use their three skiffs to visit the islands on the outside of the board. Each island gives a different benefit. The amount of skiffs, skiffs that can be placed on each island is based on your player count. Most of the islands give resources in the form of sails or coins or cannonballs. Some islands let you take resources of your choice, including one that also gives the start player 
the uh, compass rose to that player. There's even one island that lets you trade up two resources for any two other. Now, there's also an island that lets you scrap cards from your deck. Now, note in this game, anytime you scrap a card, you get the resources shown on that card. This includes your starting deck cards. Another island lets you upgrade your ship. You discard the resources shown on one of those ship upgrade cards and place it face up. That card now has a special effect for the rest of the game and is worth infamy at the end of the game. Now, when going to the market island, instead of placing your skiff on the island, you actually place it on the card you wish to purchase. Cards aren't purchased until the end of the round, so you can place your skiff on a card that you can't even afford. Also, before placing your skiff, you can wipe the market, replacing any cards currently not marked by a player from previous rounds and replacing them. Now, during this phase, you can also claim for one, to one of the four flag tokens. Um, there are four of these that each gives you an immediate in-game bonus. You claim flag, you get to do it. Now, if you choose a flag that's already owned by another player, you, instead of taking it from the board, steal it from them. Now, in addition to this, once you have these flags, when you get to the C phase, if you play a card that has a flag symbol on it that matches a card you own or a flag you own, you then get that bonus again. So kind of think of the Star Realm faction bonus thing, but instead with physical flag. Now, once everyone has placed all three of their skiffs, players then have the option to buy the cards that their skiffs are on in the market. This is optional. You could have just placed your skiff there to stop someone else from buying it or change your mind or whatever. Unlike many deck building games, the card goes directly into your hand rather than onto your discord pile. So you can use it in that in this next phase. And that next phase is the C phase. Here, players are going to take turns playing cards from their hand and moving and firing with their ships, as well as taking any special captain actions. Each card depicts what your ship will do on it. And there are three card types, moving, firing, and pivoting. Sorry, movement, fire, pivot cards. And there are some cards that combine both. So you might move and fire, or you might pivot, then move. Now, many of the movement cards also give the player the option to spend sails, which again is one of the three resources to move further. And every shot you make with those cannons is going to cost you a cannonball token. As is fitting for an Age of Sail game, cannons can normally only be fired out the sides of your ship. Some ships, of course, and captains have rules to have ways to break this rule, though. Now, when a ship is hit, the player takes a damage card and puts it into their discard. These clog up your deck and are worth negative points at the end of the game. Now, the shooting player also earns infamy based on where you've hit, with extra being uh, awarded for hits to the front or rear of your opponent's ship. Now, when moving about the board, players can pick up booty tokens. That's a sunken treasure, which will give them resources. Now, ships can only carry one token at a time, but these can be spent at any time for a single action, both in the island phase and the sea phase. Whenever someone claims some of this pirate booty, you're going to roll the dice and put a new token out on a random spot on the board. There are also rules for running into the rocks, ramming other ships, being turned around by whirlpools, or getting pushed by gusts of wind. And it's very important to remember that these seas are magical and wrap around at the edges of the board. Once everyone's played all their cards during the sea phase, you move on to another island phase, with players collecting more resources, improving their decks, claiming flags, etc., followed by another sea phase, and so on. So the game ends at the end of the round in which the last damage card is dealt to a player. You finish off that round completely using any additional damage cards as required, and then players total their infamy. You earn infamy during the game by shooting or ramming other opponents, as well as for some captain's abilities. At the end of the game, you get infamy for the cards you have purchased and completed ship upgrades. You lose points for damage cards still in your deck. So that just leaves the sea monster expansion part of this. So first off, this gives you two new captains that can be paired with any of the existing ships. Now, both of these captains do require that you use at least one of the optional sea monsters that are also part of this small expansion. Now, these sea monsters come in three forms. There are sharks, the sea serpent, and the kraken. Each of these comes with its own deck as well as wooden tokens. The sharks are in play during the island phase, showing up at it, different islands as throughout the game. And when you go there, you have to either uh, scare them away with a cannon shot, which earns you infamy, or take damage. 
Now, the Kraken and Sea Serpent are part of the C phase and go on to the main board. You're going to put new tokens on the map. Now, shooting these features removes them from the map and earns infamy, but then you have to draw a card from the appropriate deck. These cards will have the Sea Monster attack or have you place more tokens out into the board. Now, each Sea Monster is unique, with the Kraken having tentacles placed on the board and eventually its head surfaces. Whereas the Sea Serpent starts with its head out and every around it moves and another hump jaw uh, gets added to the board trailing behind. Now, I first heard about Seas of Havoc when the Kickstarter was live. And we may have actually talked about it on a Sunday brunch episode. I can't remember if we did or not. I know I looked at it. And I guess I was personally drawn by the idea of these mechanics being combined. Mechanics I'll enjoy. You got a worker placement game. You got a deck building game. And you have programmed movement. I love program movement games in particular, and I've never seen these three mechanics combined in one game. Yeah, I was hesitant because Age of Sails and Pirates aren't really my jam. Neither is tactical combat, frankly, but it was also a deck builder. So I was a little bit intrigued. Now, I didn't back at the time um, and I didn't hear much about the game again until Rock Manor Games reached out looking to generate some buzz now that the Kickstarter was done and the production copies were out and the game was on the market. So I jumped at this chance to check it out. Now, the unboxing showed off some great components, but it, it still didn't sell me on the game. While nice, they weren't giving me any magic key to making this the game for me. Now, what I was impressed by in the unboxing was just how the, the, the quality of everything. I was impressed by what we were sent. Um, the Sea Monster edition we got, again, thanks, Brock Manor, is basically the retail version with the Monsters mini expansion added in. Like, there's no deluxe stuff here. There is a Captain's edition, which seems like it have some nice to have stuff, like a wooden chest and metal coins and 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 things like that. But this is just additional content for the game that's in there. And I just, it's a Kickstarter, right? Anytime we get a Kickstarter, I'm always wary of games being underproduced um and and not polished not not play tested not the designs kind of lacking or well sometimes overproduced where it's all just flash and minis and fancy box inserts and the gameplay is lacking and there was none of that here well okay the box insert wasn't great but i mentioned that earlier so this is where games like that can really go either way while it looks great there's just no real way to know if the game itself is great or completely broken based on what you pull out of the box now, thankfully, in this case, this was a real game and not a mess that hadn't been properly developed. Yeah, one of the most impressive things in this game, though, is the rule book. I, I don't call it rule books all that often. I always like to comment if they're good or bad, but this is one of the most best written, most clear rule books from a board game I've ever read. And what it's really good at is its succinctness. There's no words wasted. Um, and I got to appreciate the large font. I appreciate that as well. Because um, as you've heard in our overview of play, there's a lot going on in this game, but it was presented in a logical order that just made sense. They also included great reference cards for both normal games and when using AI ships. Reference cards, which actually help. And while after a few plays, you may not need them, they are fantastic for new players, uh, for your first few plays at the very least, as well as a quick reminder when you need it. Which leads me to the next highlight, which is how good this game plays at all player counts. I love the way you can play with up to three AI ships and the AI here works rather well. It, it doesn't feel forced and there's not there's not a lot of questioning. Oh, should I do this or this? It was all very clear. You just draw a card and go through it. You can play solo versus one, two or three ships. You can play two players just battling each other, but you can also play two players with an AI ship. Or you can play four ships, two humans and, and two AI, and you can all battle each other. Or you could do two humans on the same team fighting against the AIs, turning it into a cooperative game. Even at four players, you could throw in an AI ship just for some chaos. I love any game that gives you sliders like this, ways to modify it to make the game different for different player counts and different player skills. So it turned out after my first play that I really enjoyed the game, despite a few things we did extreme, of course. As I often find, I could see the gold under the tarnish of our bad play. This was a game that had some real meat to it. And I think the focus of that is the asymmetry. Yeah, and, and I got to love the asymmetry and variability in Seas of Havoc. It, it's almost unprecedented. Everyone knows I love asymmetry, but this game is like dripping with it. 
every captain is unique. Every ship is unique. And then every possible combination of those is going to give you a different experience. This game provides some recommended combos. And yes, some captains probably work better with some ships. But to me, that's a feature. That was that combined with the different player count combinations means there are so many ways to play Seas of Havoc. You, probably no game would ever be similar to another. This game just plays differently and forces you to play differently with different ships and captains. You simply can't play the same game with the junk as with the ship of the line, nor with the merchant or the pirate queen. And then with the version we've got, you've got sea monsters. Those add even more variety because you can use one, two, three, or none of them. They can be used at any player count with or without AI. Like personally, I like to take, toss out at least one. I, I especially like one of the ones used in the sea phase because it gives more opportunity to score infamy than just shooting each other. I like that option and I can shoot the sea monster instead. And it's also good if you're like, you know, kind of off in the other corner of the map while players are battling it out somewhere. You don't feel too lost. There's something you can do. The really magical thing about these Seas of Havoc is how small you'll find them. You're going yeah. to be ramming or shooting something. Running and hiding just isn't an option, aside from the fact that you want the infamy for doing damage to other players anyway. Yeah, the board's really not that big, and the important thing that you're going to miss the first game, and it's worth pointing out to players multiple times while you're playing, the board wraps around. That's for both movement and cannon fire. Once you realize that, you realize just how small this map is. And honestly, I think that's a good design. It means people are going to be in conflict with each other, which is the core, core key of the game. Which digs us to the actual gameplay of the game. I dig it. I dig it quite a bit. Um, to be fair, the description's long and it sounds complicated. And I'm like, I'm throwing out five different types of mechanics we're using at once. But it actually all just works well together and it's pretty simple. There's just something about the flow of this game that feels elegant. You're going to use workers to get stuff. Then you're going to use the stuff to move around the board and shoot each other. Turns are quick. Um, I've never met anyone with a lot of AP while playing this game. Um, while there is a program movement aspect, it's never felt limiting. Like if you play, say, Robo Rally, sometimes you're like, all I can do is turn left. I've never had that problem in this game. Most movement cards give you multiple options. And yeah, now and then I'm like, oh, I wish I had this right card here. But that just led me to think, man, I need to buy more turning cards or I need to watch the market for a pivot card to come up. I never felt constrained. If there's a limit, it's actually usually the resources you, you have as opposed to the cards. And the island phase can leave you struggling to find a way to use the cards you've got if you didn't collect the resources you needed or you spent the ones you did have. Now, one thing people may not like in this game is the randomness, right? They call this an age of sale game, and I almost hate doing that. It's like calling things a train game, right? Because it has a connotation, a war gamer connotation to it. That's not really what this is. That is part of it. This is a deck building game that is card driven, and luck of the draw is a thing. Luck as to what comes up in the market, as well as what's in your hand in your deck. Due to the variability of the movement cards in the game, which is makes it a very tactical game. This is not a strategic game. The randomness of other players, what they do, the actions they take is big. You really can't predict what the board state will be. Not only like round to round, but turn to turn. Like you're going to play your one card, move your ship, and then everything could change before it gets back to you. Then there's the way things are placed on the board. Everything's randomly placed with 2D6 is doing a coordinate grid. Starting placement is affected by this. You can start, well, you wouldn't be starting facing a rock because you get to choose which way you're picking, but you could be between a rock and a hard place, basically. You could be nowhere near any of the sunken treasure. And the way the sunken treasure and shipwrecks work, as soon as someone grabs them, they randomly show up. If they keep randomly showing up right in front of another player, that can get a little annoying. Now, this randomness gets even more increased when you use sea monsters because where those tentacles and humps and heads are showing up is also randomized. Now, thankfully, I don't think the game goes full of Meritrash here. Um, you're not rolling to hit and rolling to defend or anything like that, but it is more random than you may think, especially for something calling itself an Age of Sail game. This is probably the biggest downfall of the game for me. There is all this meaty strategy and asymmetry and thoughtful action selection, but your best plans can be laid astray by a roll of the dice. It's more a blend, modern blend of American and Euro styles. But that's yeah. not for everyone out there. 
Some people prefer the determinism of a pure euro without the randomness that can ruin well-laid plans. Now, as someone who loves program movement games, who digs deck building mechanics, and who's been in love with worker placement since Kalis, I've found a lot to like in Seas of Havoc. I, of course, also adore the asymmetry that is baked right in. While I am completely indifferent to the theme, uh, to be honest, I'd probably be more drawn to this if it was ships fighting around a gravity well. At least then the wrapping board would make more sense. I find myself enjoying every play of Seas of Havoc. Yeah, this game has a lot going on. And while we said before that the age limit may be component-based, it's also not a kid's game by any means. This is a mid-weight game, but not, uh, not light fare. Additionally, it can be frustrating when people are perceived as picking on you, but you're going to need to learn that if someone is in front of your cannons, you shoot them. And they'll do yep. the same as the because it's the primary means of gaining infamy. Now, this can certainly make for some awkward nights at the dinner table if you've been <laughs> unloading your ship of the line's heavy cannon on your kids. Now, overall, Seas of Havoc's been a hit with everyone I played it with, though it does appeal to some players more than others. I personally really dig it. My wife is pretty indifferent, and as you've heard, Sean likes parts of it more than others. Local gamers I played with have enjoyed it. I've had no one that said they had a bad time. And I've actually had two people request I bring it out to future events so they can explore it more. For me, it's the exploration that I'm really interested in. Trying out the different ship captain and ship combos. But I'm not sure after exploring all those combos, how much I'll be eager to keep playing it. Now, there may be a combination that sits perfectly with me and keeps me coming back. But for the moment, I haven't found that one. So I got to say, if you're going to try every possible combination, it's a ridiculous amount. I did six to the power of six, whatever that works out to six factorial. So that's six times five times four times three times two times one. I didn't do the math. I think that's how you calculate that one. What I will do is I hadn't called it out before. One of the things that's included in the box is a little checklist so that you can actually match them off and put down your score to see how you've been doing. So there's definitely an achievement seeker aspect of the game that I think is going to appeal to some people. If you're a fan of any of the core mechanics here, if you like deck building or if you like worker placement games or if you dig naval battle games, you probably find a way to try out Seas of Havoc if you can. The worker placement works great. The deck building is interesting and well done. And I, I particularly that flag driven combo system is kind of neat. You get this and like they're powerful. They're like scrap a card in your deck, take an extra turn, get free resources. If you can build a deck combo with flags. It's really neat. Program movement's interesting. And what I like is it's not limiting. You're not stuck with only left and right turns, right? It's generally a move forward and turn. Or it, it, it's pretty open compared to other program movement games. And I got to say, I dig the naval battle aspects. But again, it's light. This is light naval battle. You're, you're not looking at a historical recreation. Yeah, this definitely isn't going to give you the full on age of sail, piracy on the high seas, historical battles. It does, however, scratch a similar itch in shorter form. Now, if you dig all those mechanics and love asymmetry, if you're like me, if you like the same kind of games as me, you should probably pick this one up. Just be aware of the tactical nature of the game. This is, again, not a historical simulation anyway. This is more of a fast and furious sea battle between asymmetric pirates that's being played in about an hour. You're not going to be worrying about tacking the wind or running up more sheets to escape. It's much more likely you're going to be slamming into anyone and everyone near you in order to uh, gain more infamy. Now, if you collect pirate games and just love everything pirates, I think Seas of Havoc will probably be a hit. Despite combining multiple different popular board game mechanics, the game itself is quite straightforward and has a great flow. Even with its weight, I think the game this is a game many players are going to enjoy regardless of their experience level. Like, honestly, I look at this one. I know Sean was talking about playing with kids, but I think 10-year-old me would have loved this game. The nice thing about it is, while it has a little bit of weight, if you're not being super aggressively competitive, it works as a slightly lighter game. Finally, be aware this isn't for everyone. This is not a quick rapid fire dice chucker with cannonballs firing left and right, nor is it a deep resource management euro about customizing your ship. If you don't like any of the core mechanics, I can't see Seas of Havoc winning you over, which is the combination. It's it just the combination of them aren't like 
they're all there, but they're always used in very pure ways. So you're, you're, there's no innovation in the deck building, no innovation in the worker placement. All of that's the fact they combined all these together into a naval war game that really sticks out as something new and unique. The actual individual parts, though, are pretty straightforward. Well, there you have our thoughts on Seas of Havoc from Rock Banner Game, one of many pirate games out there on the market, but one that takes a uh, takes a variety of popular Euro mechanics and combines them in a new way. Now, what's your favorite pirate-themed board game? Tell us about it in the comments. Or better yet, join our Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com and strike up a conversation there.